Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. So happy you made time for the CHP, one of the top China history-related podcasts out there for 10 years running. I have several PDFs of awards attesting to this fact. What a mess last episode. Once the first Tang emperor handed all his authority to his eunuchs, they never let go and were able to entrench themselves to such an extent that the last hundred years of the dynasty... The chief eunuch and all those below him on the inner palace pyramid held on to all the important levers of power, including the military, and the government was hopelessly divided on everything, and military governors had turned into military warlords. The Tang Dynasty never recovered. And we finished off last episode with the eventual death of the dynasty after Li Maozhen Zhu Wen and others coordinated their attacks so that the Tang, after a glorious and ignominious 289-year run, was finally finished off in 907. Five dynasties and ten kingdoms period followed, 907 and 979, the Kitan Liao dynasty, 916 to 1125. If you're interested in the Kitan Liao, I cordially invite you to go check out that Yelu Abaji episode, CHP 126. During this Wu Dai Shi Guo period, following the Tang, China was all divided up into different political entities. And then in 960, Zhao Kuangyin, a military strongman in the Hozhou, the later Zhou dynasty, the fifth of these five dynasties, he usurped the throne, put an end to the dynasty, and founded the great. Song Dynasty, 960 to 1279, although it all came crashing down in a tragic and spectacular fashion. These 319 years were a true great leap forward for China and Chinese culture. Even though it had been a good half century since the fall of the final Tang Emperor and the founding of the Song the general feeling about eunuchs was still quite fresh, and it was Zhao Kuangyin himself early on in his reign as the first Song Emperor Taizu, who demanded someone keep a lid on these eunuchs and do not let a repeat of the Tang happen in his Song dynasty. They put a cap on the number of eunuchs at 180, about 99,800 less than the Ming emperors would employ much later on down the timeline. And I must say, like with the early emperors of the Tang, Where eunuchs were indispensable, they continued on like they had always done, the way they were intended to serve. They still acted in the capacity of the emperor's personal agents, supervised the day-to-day administration of palace maintenance, services and operations, and personally looked after all those who lived inside, and quite often became their closest confidants. And of course, their original raison d'etre, they still guarded the women's quarters and well, you know, made sure no funny business was going on that might put a green hat on the emperor's head, so to speak. So the Song Dynasty, it was rather lacking in the kind of eunuch drama that was seen in the Tang from the end of Xuanzong to Emperor Ai, and certainly nothing like the Ten Attendants during the Han Dynasty's final years. But there was one guy, well, there were several, but only one stood out, the He Li Jiqun of the Song Dynasty eunuchs, and certainly of the Northern Song Dynasty. He actually makes a few top ten worst eunuchs list, but, I don't know, in many popular accounts of late Northern Song history, the eunuch general Tong Guan, he gets blamed for being the biggest contributor to the demise and ultimate horrific end to the Song Dynasty headquartered in Kaifeng, Henan Province. However, the dynasty, after suffering such blunt force trauma at the hands of the Jurchens from the north, well, the Zhao ruling family would rise again in Hangzhou as the southern Song dynasty. So, Tong Guan, why did he deserve such ill repute and downright infamy? Well, we all know the Huizong story, right? CHP episodes 132 to 135, a four-parter, won all kinds of awards in the Huizong category, of course. The eunuch general Tong Guan was Emperor Huizong's right-hand man. Well, one of them. He's also a character from the great novel The Water Margin, but 
Let's not get into that here. Tong Guan, as a general, eh, he was no Meng Tian or Bai Qi. But under the Emperor Shenzong's reign, Tong Guan had won some key battles. He wasn't the only eunuch serving in the Song military, which was by no means uncommon late in the northern Song. I'm not sure of his win-loss record, but thanks to his luck on the battlefield, he came to Hui Zong's attention and became one of his trusted advisors. I think it was written in the official histories that Tong Guan was famous for his overuse of flattery and the whole fine art of Pai Ma Pi. By 1116, he had become Hui Zong's go-to guy for all political matters. First time since the fall of the Tang that a eunuch had risen that high. I'm sure that raised a few eyebrows around the palace. Now, I don't want to get sidetracked or anything, but Hui Zong's most right hand of right hand men was Tsai Jing, his chancellor. Tsai Jing had not survived a political struggle and had been banished, and it was Tong Guan who advocated for Tsai Jing and got him back his old job. But later on, Tsai Jing will come to greatly fear Tong Guan. Tong Guan spent a decade fighting the Western Xia. Again, the official Song Shi, or official history of Song, says he fabricated military reports from the front. He had been sent out west to around Shanxi, Ningxia, and Gansu to put the western Xia away. They had been nibbling away on China's western edges for too long and needed to be taught a lesson. Well, the ones who ended up getting schooled was Song China, and the whole thing, when it was all over, ended with the Huizong Emperor having to send a formal apology to the Western Xia for all the troubles. And Tong Guan all along had been sending these glowing reports from the front to Kaifeng and had risen higher up the power structure thanks to that. And Huizong oh, couldn't say enough good things about him. And with all this power and unearned prestige, Huizong sent Tong Guan on a high-profile mission to the Kitanliao Empire to negotiate with them about handing back the infamous 16 prefectures that stretched from Shanxi province east to Tianjin. This part of China, and a core part of China at that, had been lost following the fall of the Tang, and then acquired by the Liao when they were on a roll back in the 10th century. Hui Zong wanted these 16 prefectures back, and he sent Tong Guan to see if there was any chance of making a deal. The Liao... They knew full well who Tong Guan was, and they refused to deal with a eunuch. The mission and the objective all fell apart from there, and Tong Guan went back empty-handed. But he did come up with a plan. And I think it's probably this that later on earned him so much opprobrium. He was the one who suggested to Emperor Hui Zong, why don't we make an alliance with the Jurchens up north, and together we'll take down the Kitans. And once that's done... We'll convince the Jurchens to let us take back the 16 prefectures. Hui Zong, though he'll live to regret it later, thought it was a splendid idea and gave it his full backing, going against the majority of his ministers. And just as this started to ramp up in 1120, down in Zhejiang province, a rebellion broke out, led by a man named Fang La. Hui Zong sent Tong Guan to go deal with this, and though he didn't capture Fang La personally, he was instrumental in putting down the rebellion in 1121 and accompanied the rebel leader back to Kaifeng and had front row seats at his execution, which was great because Fang La got the old Ling Chur, or death of a thousand cuts. But Tong Guan's acclaim wasn't to last, and in his campaign to wrest the 16 prefectures away from the Liao, he ended up suffering a disastrous defeat. And I won't retell the whole lugubrious tale of the last years of the northern Song, except to say after Tong Guan's forces got routed by the Liao, the Jurchens took notice, and they saw the Song was standing on feet of clay and were ripe and ready to be taken down. But before they did that, the Jurchens went and extinguished the Kitan Liao themselves, and then they turned their sights on the Song. And by 1127, the northern Song dynasty was out of business. The capital, Kaifeng, wrecked and razed to the ground, and just a mere shell of its former splendor. The whole royal court was shivering away up in Manchuria, suffering fates that rival death itself. 
As I said, the Song Dynasty made a comeback in the south. As far as the north of China went, that was surrendered to the Jurchen Jin Dynasty. About 107 years later, those guys will get walloped by the Mongols. Eunuchs continued serving the Zhao family during the southern Song, but there was no power grabs or anyone who rose to Tongguan's notoriety. So, we may as well jump to what's really the one true period in Chinese history where eunuchs will earn that most foul and odious reputation as the most avaricious, revengeful, hateful, power-hungry, self-serving you-know-whats. Tongguan, by the way, when the Jin forces were coming in for the kill, well, he accompanied Huizong to the south, trying to lead him to safety. But the Qinzong emperor, who got to inherit the throne from his father, Huizong, ordered Tongguan killed. The order was carried out, and Tongguan's head was brought back to Kaifeng. So before we jump ahead, let me again emphasize, all these rotten eunuchs who were so deceitful, they were not representative of the whole group. The overwhelming majority just did their jobs and had no impact on decision-making, let alone the direction of Chinese history. Two noteworthy Song Dynasty eunuchs, I'll mention them very quickly, uh, Liu Chenggui, 951 to 1016, the beginning of the Song, he did a lot to standardize weights and measures that hung around forever. He's also credited with inventing the dengzi, a small stilliard. You've seen these things before, I'm sure. A scale that's used for weighing precious metals, gems, medicine, and, you know, these kinds of things that required precision. These dengzis were still being used on the streets of Hong Kong when I was there in the 1990s. Jia Xian. 1010 to 1070, he was another eunuch serving at the palace in the early Song. I'm sure he has a significant entry in uh, Needham's Science and Civilization in China. He was noteworthy, among other reasons, for describing Pascal's Triangle 600 years before Blaise Pascal himself came up with it. Just one of China's great mathematicians, Jia Xian. So, nothing really extraordinary to mention about eunuchs during the Yuan Dynasty. The palace officials took measures to ensure they never ran into any eunuch problem. Eunuchs who served at the Yuan court came from all over the empire. During the Ming, however, they developed quite a problem. So, without further ado, let's see how the most famous and notorious eunuch infestation in all of Chinese history unfolded. We'll look at the big four and of course others, and you'll be able to see all the destructive things these late Ming Dynasty eunuchs did to cause the dynasty to fall so hard like it did. Zhu Yuanzhang, after he founded the Ming Dynasty, he recognized immediately that although one had to be vigilant to the extreme about palace eunuchs, he still used them. Maybe only a hundred to start, but he saw their value. Many eunuchs were drawn from captured soldiers and civilians defeated in the Ming conquest of the bordering regions. The most famous, of course, being Zheng He, who was captured as a young lad down in the Yunnan area in Unicized. And many of those who today count themselves among China's 56 ethnic minorities, they too, when they went down in defeat against the Ming forces, they too provided another reliable pool of eunuchs. And we'll look at one of them next episode. The organization of the eunuchs created this vast bureaucracy, and Zhu Yuanzhang, the Hongwu emperor, he got things going early, creating 12 offices in the palace to manage every single aspect of palace administration and operations. And by the end of his reign in 1398, a full-fledged bureaucracy was in place, called the 24 Offices, or Arsha Yaman. Twelve directorates, four agencies, and eight bureaus. And the directorate of palace eunuchs, the Nei Gong Jian, that office, ran the whole show inside the palace. The boss was the chief eunuch who oversaw everything. This is how the seed got planted. The Hongwu emperor was adamant that eunuchs be kept illiterate and must not get involved in any aspect of politics. In fact, he had an iron plaque placed in a prominent location in the palace that said plainly, quote, Eunuchs are forbidden to interfere with government affairs. Those who attempt to do so will be subjected to capital punishment. 
end quote. Well, despite all these warnings and prohibitions, it didn't take very long for this well-intentioned organization put in place by this dynasty founder to grow into a vast jungle. If anyone could look ahead to the 15th or 16th centuries, maybe they might have done this a little differently. The problem started perhaps during the reign of the Hongwu Emperor's son, Yongle. As you no doubt recall, he was involved in a very nasty succession struggle with his nephew, who ended up being named the heir to the throne instead of him. And this whole bloody brouhaha led the Yongle Emperor to go to fantastic and violent extremes to stamp out this Qianwen emperor, as well as all his supporters, family, and political allies. And the Yongle emperor turned to his eunuchs and gave them a significant role in doing his bidding. The court officials, well, they leaned in the Qianwen emperor's direction rather than Yongle. Under Yongle, who never forgot the assistance of his eunuchs during his power struggle, made the eunuchs an extension of his authority. And because of this, government officials dared not challenge them in any way. (laughs) To do so would be suicidal and tantamount to going against the emperor. Set up in 1384, the Si Li Qian, or innocuous-sounding Directorate of Ceremonial, became the most powerful office after the emperor. And he who led this directorate led the whole eunuch bureaucracy. Besides the management of all eunuch personnel on the payroll, this head of the Si Li Qian oversaw both banal and critical jobs, such as maintaining palace security, the eunuch school, the imperial libraries and works of art, the imperial tombs, and filtering every and all documents that the emperor had to see. He was also responsible for meeting out rewards and punishments. In general... The director of this Si Li Jian, Directorate of Ceremonial, he had the most face time with the emperor himself. And for this reason, his influence in bending decisions in a certain direction was most strong. 1420, the imperial palace in Beijing was completed. This is the famous Forbidden City, China's number one tourist attraction. Well, top five, I'm sure. And in this place... All the eunuchs, mighty and mundane, all lived, worked, and died for the next 500 years. This was the center of their world until the last of them got kicked out in the 1920s. And once the palace was built and staffed and ready for the business of running the empire, another institution was established. This was the Eastern Depot, or Dongchang. They worked in consort with the dreaded... Jin Yi Wei, the embroidered uniform guard who was set up under Hongwu. Their headquarters used to be located right where the Great Hall of the People stands today. They were both an imperial secret police, personal bodyguard to the emperor, and also a full-blown military force who took their marching orders directly from the emperor. Later on, the Eastern Depot will take over the embroidered uniform guard, And you'll have all these eunuchs controlling not only the secret police, but the military as well. And through their control of the emperor, they ran the government too. They were like the the Spanish Inquisition. And nobody ever expected them. I mentioned it before. Let me say it again. Eunuchs thrived best whenever there was some weak or incompetent emperor on the throne. Emperors like Hongwu, Yongle, they wouldn't stand for any eunuch power grabbing. But if you had someone who wasn't so interested in the job, uh, this is where the eunuch stepped in. And as we saw in the Han and in the Tang, once they settled in, he had to burn the place down to get rid of them. Many scholars will tell you by the end of the reign of Emperor Xuande, grandson of Yongle, it was mostly all downhill for the Ming Dynasty. Xuande, 1425 to 1435, he is sometimes called the Huizong of the Ming due to his passion for literature and the arts and his patronage of so many people of talent. So let's introduce the first of the four eunuch dictators who attracted the most infamy during the Ming dynasty. This one, Wang Zhen, got his start under Shen De. Wang Zhen has particular notoriety beyond the epic fortune he accumulated and the extent of his avaricious personality that drove him to never stop adding to his horn of plenty. 
His main victim was the Zhengtong Emperor. He was all of eight years old when Xuan De died all too soon. Emperor Xuan De had found all kinds of good traits in Wang Zhen and helicoptered him up to the Directorate of Ceremonial. So when the Emperor died so sudden and unexpected, without any clear succession plans having been worked out, Wang Zhen was perfectly positioned to make a power grab. His nemesis was the Grand Dowager Empress, who tried to protect the young Zhengtong Emperor. She hung in there, doing her best to shield the Emperor from eunuch influence until 1442, when she died. The Emperor Zhengtong was only 15, and with this political obstacle out of the way, this is where Wang Zhen steps forward and puts the first nail in the Ming Dynasty coffin. Wang Zhen, what is there to say? He was no Duke of Zhou, that's for sure. With this young lamb in his care, the emperor, rather than protect him and wisely guide him in the ways of leadership, eh, Wang Zhen embarked on one of the most reckless attempts to further his own fortunes and all of China's long history, which was already quite long by Wang Zhen's time. So, besides his little reign of terror and all the ultra-corruption, the big thing that earned him the first spot among the four eunuch dictators of the Ming Dynasty was the Tumu Bao Zhibian, the Tumu Fortress Crisis. The Rump Mongol Dynasty, now called the Northern Yuan, well, during the reign of the Zhengtong Emperor, these Oirat Mongols had among their ranks one of those occasional charismatic and capable warrior leaders who, after rising to the top, united everyone and went on a rampage. And this was Essen Taishir. He was terrorizing the Ming up in the north around Shanxi and putting a lot of pressure on the dynasty, who's so close to Beijing. Wang Zhen came up with a plan to put together a fighting force that would be too big to fail. History records this massive army was about half a million men strong. And Wang Zhen's plan called for this force to be sent in the direction of Datong in Shanxi, and once there, he would teach Essen a lesson. And Wang Zhen put himself in charge of the army. He wasn't what you would call a military man, but eh, how hard could it be to lead an army of half a million troops? Now, Wang Zhen's hidden agenda to this whole debacle in the making was for him and his eunuch agents to skim off the profits of military procurement and to manage all these other schemes to essentially make money for himself and his relatives. Everyone at the imperial court was dead set against this military plan. No one thought it was a good idea. And when Wang Zhen said he was going to have the Zhengtong emperor himself lead the troops into battle... Everyone knew this was a disaster waiting to happen. But Wang Chun had blinders on and was thinking solely about the profits he was going to rake in during the course of this battle against the northern Yuan Mongols. When the two armies met up at a place called Tumu, about halfway between Beijing and Zhangjiakou, the Ming army of half a million men was wiped out by a Mongol force of, it said, only 20,000 troops. In the annals of Chinese history, it's called the worst military defeat of a Chinese army since the age when Pangu was walking the earth. And when the dust settled, guess who captured the Zhengtong Emperor? <laughs> yeah, the Oirat Mongols. Essen could hardly believe his good luck. He thought he was sitting on a gold mine. But as we'll find out, back in Beijing, upon hearing of the Zhengtong Emperor's terrible predicament, they opted to simply give him up for lost, and rather than negotiate for his return, instead, they put the emperor's brother on the throne, and he became the Jingtai emperor. With the palace in crisis following this Tumu incident, the minister of war, Yu Qian, became the man of the hour, organizing the defense and stepping up to manage the crisis precipitated by the Zhengtong emperor's capture. Many said, if not for Yu Qian, that would have been the end of the Ming dynasty right there. So Essen thought he had the ultimate bargaining chip, but as we'll see, after endless negotiation and the Ming side saying, hey, you could keep him, finally Essen just let him go. And this pile of gold that he thought he was sitting on turned out to be nothing but pyrite. And after the Zhengtong Emperor was captured and the Ming army was wiped out, everyone turned on Wang Chun 
blaming everything on him, and rightly so. And he was given a very bloody and violent send-off. So, September 1449, a date which will live in infamy in Chinese military history. The following year, the Zhengtong Emperor, after being released by Essen, showed up in Beijing thinking he'd be welcomed back with a parade and lots of fanfare and that he'd quickly be restored as emperor. But he ended up being sorely disappointed and got sequestered away and viewed as one big embarrassment. And the epilogue to all this is that his brother, who took over as emperor following the Tumu crisis, who reigned as emperor Jing Tai, after he died in 1457, the Zhengtong emperor ended up being restored to the throne and got to enjoy a second stint as ruler of China, reigning this time as the Tianshun emperor, which yeah, I guess in a way makes him the Grover Cleveland of Chinese imperial history. At least in the Ming, that is. And the Jingtai emperor? Yeah, he was the Benjamin Harrison. And for good measure, the now Tianshun emperor went and had Yu Qian executed for not trying to negotiate his return and facilitating having his brother take over as emperor, and leaving him in that disgraceful limbo for so long, eating nothing but Mongol food all the time. Yeah, the Zhengtong emperor, or Tianshun emperor, if you prefer, he went after everyone who voted to leave him for dead and who sided with electing his brother emperor. This two-time emperor was followed by his son, the Chenghua emperor, all of 17 years old. Not as young as the eunuchs liked their emperors, but still pliable. Enough of a stink had been made about the disastrous foibles of Wang Jun. Eunuchs had to lay low for a while. But by the end of the Chenghua Emperor's reign, another eunuch insinuated himself into the upper echelons of the power structure. And this one, Wang Zhe, the second eunuch dictator of the Ming Dynasty, we'll look at him next time in Part 4. <laughs> So much for introducing this topic in two episodes. Hey, it's not too late. You can help keep the CHP going for at least a couple more weeks. Patreon.com slash China History Podcast. That's where you can go to support me and my Sisyphean efforts to bring you all this enjoyable Chinese history. Well, enjoyable for me. Patreon.com slash China History Podcast. I hope you'll consider that. Don't want to give you the hard sell. Okay, this here's Laszlo Montgomery. I thank you for tuning in and spending this time with me. Please carve out a half hour and a couple weeks time for what's shaping up to be another exciting episode of the China History Podcast. And if you can't wait two weeks, there's over 250 hours of stuff already there that you can go check out a second time. Okay, take care, everyone.